Well, welcome to this breakout on venture capital. My name is Aaron Price. I'm the founder, or the CEO of Tech United New Jersey. We're a nonprofit group that's built to empower entrepreneurship and innovation in the region. We're also a partner in a venture fund in New Jersey called Tech Council Ventures. And this panel is about getting access to venture funding and what that means and what that looks like. So pleased to have our panelists with us. If uh, Vaughn, you could go first and introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Aaron, and <clears throat> thanks to the Middlesex County team for asking me to join and for those who did show up <laughs> to hear about venture capital. Um, but I am Vaughn Crow. I'm one of the managing partners at Newark Venture Partners, which is an early stage seed stage fund based in Newark, New Jersey. A national seed stage platform investing throughout the country, disproportionately concentrated in New Jersey and the New York region to help support the tech ecosystem here in, this, in the city of Newark, <clears throat> as well as the state of New Jersey. Uh, we're investing out of our second fund, which is a roughly $90 million fund, which actually counts uh, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority as one of our limited partners, both in fund one and in this current fund of fund two. And the strategic focus or investment strategy <clears throat> that we deploy at Newark Venture Partners is such that <clears throat> we'll write up to a $3 million check in any business that is B2B software, disproportionately focused in four key verticals, healthcare, financial services, often referred to as FinTech, healthcare, uh, and audio. And we like to leverage the resources that we have in the New Jersey community, the corporate community, to bring value to our early stage founders who are looking to sell into companies, further refine its strategy around its go to market or product market fit, et cetera. And then we tend to like to own north of 10% of a business such that if there is a big enough outcome, it works well for Kathleen and her team, and it obviously would work well for the general partners at Newark Ventures. So Aaron, that's a, in a nutshell who we are. Fun fact is I was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, and so as I was saying to Aaron and Kathleen in the back, it's real fun to be running and working with a team uh, where the name and the shingle is Newark Venture Partners, you know, hometown boy, I think, as Kathleen said, running its, its namesake firm. So thanks again, Aaron. Look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah, likewise. Kathleen? Great. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, for those couple folks in the audience I don't know, uh, my name is Kathleen Coviello. I work with the State Economic Development Authority. Um, I've I pause when I say this every time, but I've been with the organization 17 years. It's going to be a short stop for me um, while I just got my kids through school. Um, but spent my career in the venture banking industry, so 17 <coughs> years prior uh, to the EDA in venture banking, um, where I did um, primarily debt lending to venture back companies, but also created a mezzanine fund at one of the organizations I worked at and a venture fund. So I've really worked on all transactions on the right side of the balance sheet. Um, when I joined EDA, I had a, a, a thesis that we should be supporting businesses that don't have collateral, don't have cash flow, and we don't take personal guarantees. And I think our then CEO, like, thought I was a crazy person. And I'm like, listen, I think we need to be like-minded like an investor. And we want entrepreneurs to have emptied out their bank accounts, to sold their Volvos, and um, invested their 401ks in the business. And if we can find those types of entrepreneurs, then we should be partnering with them and be partnering with the private sector. And we should share in the upside of those companies. So when those entrepreneurs are hugely successful, a percentage of those returns, like Vaughn was talking about, should come back to the EDA so that we can help them either on their next endeavor, which I think is, is something we might want to touch on, you know, how do we get serial entrepreneurs in the state, and, um, you know, help increase the capital for the EDA who does not get line item appropriations from the state budget. So um, we have built out in the last 17 years a really robust portfolio of support. Um, 
that is akin to uh, to venture capital. Sometimes we're, as I said to uh, Aaron and, and Vaughn in the back, we're the intel inside that we partner with folks like Newark Venture Partners that EDA puts money into their fund and says, you go run, make the investment decisions, add the strategic value, and help grow the companies in the state. Uh, Tech Council Ventures that Aaron mentioned, we're a limited partner uh, in that firm and fund as well, one of the founding members. Um, and sometimes we're direct in a deal. And sometimes we do it via debt. Sometimes we um, do it via grants. Sometimes we do it that support via creative financing tools like selling your losses, um, but all with that like-minded strategy of give the entrepreneurs runway to build their business, right? Uh, I know one of the other recessions is about lending. This is not lending, right? Uh, there is no cash flow from companies. You have to have a, a long mindset. Um, and interestingly enough, when I, I first started this thesis, it was, um, it was a tough sell because in, in venture, the companies that aren't going to do well fail fast, right? So it's not for the light of heart, um, and you need to cut your losses and move on. And the ones that are really going to do well, and we've had a great portfolio now of successes, many from Middlesex County, um, it takes them a little bit longer to nurture and to grow. And, you know, I think that's one of the big challenges of venture is that you have to have that, that long vision. So, you know, happy to talk a little bit more of some of the specifics, um, but that gives you a little bit of flavor for what we're doing relative to venture and the EDA. Excellent. So, first of all, this can definitely be an interactive session. So if you have questions, I will, I'm not that far away. If you just yell, I'll work them in. Um, how many people here have raised venture capital before? One, two, maybe. Great. So I'm going to assume that the, that the audience here is, wants to get to know more about what this type of funding means. And, and start with, I want to start with some of the basics, because you both used a few terms that I think we need to clarify. So I want to start with the structure of a fund. So you talked, Vaughn, about your fund. I think you said fund two is $90 million. Are you in fund two or three? Fund two. Two. So first, let's explain the idea of a fund vintage, that a fund launches at a certain, with a year and has a certain time frame by, through which it invests. The expectations of that fund, and then you know we've thrown out the terms LP a few times. Like I, I don't want to take for granted that people understand what these terms mean. So let's start with the idea of the like, what's the lifespan of a fund mean, and what's that? What's the implication to the investors, and when they put that money to work? Yeah. So 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 for Newark Venture Partners, and candidly, every firm, every fund, they can operate under a different set of guidelines. Um, but for us, our so so they're general partners. I'm one of them, um, along with my other two partners and those who have. Uh, financial incentive in that general partnership. And then our limited partners are, as Kathleen just described, those who say, hey, we believe in your strategy, we believe in what you're doing, we're going to support you with some additional capital to go out and make these bets against your strategy. And we have an expectation that you will return our capital plus a return. And for us, and particularly in venture, it's been a great run for early stage venture over the last probably decade. But you know, some will say, I'll get you, they'll underwrite their fund 3x, 5x, 7x, 10x. Right? And that's sometimes based on historical performance if you are a multi vintage fund or firm. Um, we'll, I'll get to vintage here in a moment. Um, and that's essentially what you are marketing and what you are doing as an investor. I, as the general partner, go raise money from independent third parties who are referred to as my limited partners. They entrust me as a fiduciary to go out and deploy that capital and back, in our case, back founders for us to generate a return of capital and a return on capital. For us, we like to make sure that we try and get 5x or better on that, on that capital that we've raised. Let's break that down a little bit. Let's say you're, you're raising a $100 million fund. Yep. To get the 5X, you need to, the companies that you invest in need to then distribute returns that get you back to actually $600 million, correct? Correct. And so you just explain why it's not 500 Again, I want to make sure we cover the basics. Yeah, so without getting into, weed, into the weeds of like net of fees and things of that nature, let's just take the number of, let's round it up, or be fortuitous about our next fund and say it's a $100 million fund. So you have $100 million of capital from Kathleen and friends. Um, 
So I'm now responsible for that $100 million being deployed such that in, during that investment period, which is typically five years, or over the lifetime of that particular fund, which is usually 10 years, so let's say in 2031, I've now received, after these investments, I've generated $500 million of value. Strike that, $600 million of value. So I will return to Kathleen and friends the initial 100 million, and then there's 500 million to then be distributed to all the partners, but it's not equal. Because they took such risk on Newark Venture Partners and Vaughn, Kathleen and Friends gets 80% of that 500 million that gets distributed based on how much capital they put in. And then the 20% of that 500 million, uh, which is essentially 100 million, then gets distributed to the general partnership, Vaughn and Friends. So it becomes a somewhat of a symbiotic relationship of Kathleen and Friends entrusting me to do my job, Vaughn and Friends operating as a fiduciary with expertise in a couple of key areas to return $100 million initially, and then hopefully another $500 million, such that of the 500, she gets 80, and I get 20. Great. Is that helpful? That's, that's good explanation. We're going to come back to that. Kathleen, I want to talk about the, the stages of raising capital from Again, I'm assuming you know nothing. I'm sure you know a lot, but from C to you know Series whatever D, E, F, etc. Um, can you share with people what a seed round or even what a friends and family round is? Perhaps with what an, an angel investor might do, and then in your case, how the EDA might support an angel investment. Yeah, great question. And and I'll even add, I think, to Vaughn's comments for folks that don't know, if you're an entrepreneur that's taking venture capital, there has to be an exit. Right, so I'm the LP in that fund. As Vaughn said, it's a 10-year commitment. I need that money back to reinvest. And so when entrepreneurs are trying to decide what form of capital to raise, there's a lot of decisioning that has to happen. And, and to Aaron's question around stage, right? So some folks traditionally go to their friends and family and say, mom, dad, you know, Uncle Bill, who's really rich. Um, I need money, I have this great idea. Sometimes that's more a grant, right? That, that your family doesn't expect a return. When you start to go to individuals that you don't have a familial relationship with or a friendly relationship with, it's a business decision, right? And so, Typically, angel investors are high net worth individuals that are doing angel investing to make money. The way they make money is for you to sell your business. They want to grow the business to the point that it hits that five times return that, that Vaughn mentioned. So the EDA for angel funding um, has a couple of resources. One, we are really focused under Governor Murphy's leadership on supporting diverse entrepreneurs. We started a chapter of Golden Seeds in New Jersey, which is an angel group focused on investing in women-led businesses. So New Jersey is uniquely positioned, particularly in the life science industry, particularly here in Middlesex County. We have a lot of pharma execs who have ended their career made a significant amount of wealth, personal wealth, and have a lot to give back. So we have a lot of those folks who join us and become Golden Seeds members. We have monthly office hours, companies come and pitch to us that have women-led businesses, and we consider investment opportunities. EDA really acts as a, um, an organizer for that group. We don't invest directly but we support it via our staff time. The First Lady has put a significant amount of uh, time and resources, Tammy Murphy behind this as well, because she's a true believer in you know, supporting women-led entrepreneurs, having had a career at Goldman and seeing that women are often left out of the conversation. When we look at the financial returns, women-led businesses perform extremely well. And so part of our role at the EDA is messaging the opportunities for women-led businesses and the engagement for us around these folks who have had long-standing careers in New Jersey. 
In addition to Golden Seeds, um, our board just approved a brand new program. Applications are going to be opening the end of this year where we're using federal dollars to help entrepreneurs get angel money. So it's always hardest to get that first check. We hear that from every entrepreneur, right? If you get a lead, I will come in. And so we are using um, federal dollars to match angels, but if you come to us with a term sheet, we'll make a commitment to you, conditioned upon that angel closing. Um, a one-to-one -one matching for us up to $500,000. So we want to be causal in helping that angel deal get closed. When we start to talk about seed rounds, it's generally, we're starting to look at super angels or micro VCs. And there's a lot of blurred lines. Everybody has a different interpretation of what's a, a seed round versus an a series A round. Um, but you know, it, it, it doesn't ha usually happen with, you have one meeting with Vaughn and he writes a $5 million check. Um, you know, it, it, in the state of New Jersey, we don't have enough venture capital. We are working on a lot of different mechanisms to change that. We've invested at the EDA um, across a dozen venture funds, close to $70 million. So we're partners in Tech Council Ventures, we're partners in Newark Venture Partners, we're partners in Edison Partners, Activate, Osage, FF, New Spring Capital, and those are the ones off the top of my head. Um, but we still see about 68% of venture capital in Jersey comes from out-of-state investors. And so how do we make sure that those investors spend more time in New Jersey and all of the folks in this room that want to raise venture capital have access to them? So two things we're doing. Um, no, even more than two. So we've incentivized investors to invest in New Jersey-based business. There's an investor tax credit in the state of New Jersey that investors get a 20% return for investing in New Jersey businesses. They don't have to be New Jersey residents. Um, they don't have to be, it can be a corporate investor, it can be a private investor, it can be a VC. The first deal that we did, we sent a check to a Boston investor. He called us and couldn't believe New Jersey sent him a check. So we are trying to incentivize investors to look hard at New Jersey. We're also enhancing their ROI. So as we talked about, it's all about the return on capital, right? So usually it's a long game, as we've just said, 10 years for VC. <coughs> Angels, it can go longer than 10 years because they're waiting for the VCs to come in after them. So when they look at the return on capital to get a 20% guaranteed return within six months of their investment really helps kind of unlevel the playing field. So that's one. Angel match we're doing. Um, we also just launched, you may have heard about the Evergreen Fund. So we just closed out an auction, which is our fundraising source for this, and we will start approving managers to participate in this fund. The way it'll work is it will allow approved managers to double down on their New Jersey investments up to five million dollars per deal. Vaughn talked a little bit about the financial metrics for him. We think it's really important to have VCs that are incentivized. Um, and so we want to make sure that if the managers um, are working hard, that they get rewarded um, and do well. And so um, the Evergreen Fund is structured so that whatever, whatever cash flow stream the fund manager has decided on their general deals that will carry over to the evergreen money that they invest for us and that's called their carry. Um, and so we think that's a really good causal um, indicator uh, and, and impetus to make those VCs look hard at investing in New Jersey. So, and that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Like I could keep going on and on and we'll, on. There's we'll so many to tools. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want, there was a few things. Yes, what do you got? You said uh, you're welcoming questions. You are, yeah. Awesome. Um, what are your thoughts on accelerating the presence, the VC presence in New Jersey? Would you say that we should take the approach of welcoming all innovation or focusing on a niche innovation, such as I know New Jersey farm, farm tech is huge. Winning um, down on that or welcoming like, whether it's consumer tech, whether it's ed tech, or tech, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the, the governor has laid out a pretty clear strategy around that, um, focusing on nine strategic sectors in the state. Quite honestly, they're very broad, and you could make a lot of things fit. 
one of the differentiators that we're trying is this place-based economic development where we say we're going to put a pin in the map and this is our focus on XYZ. So you might have read last year we made an announcement that we brought hacks to New Jersey. Um, we went through a state a U.S. Bake Off really. We got New Jersey was in the finalists, six other states, top six. They chose to locate in Newark. Hacks is a hardware, hard tech, hard deep manufacturer. Um, their founding partner lives in Princeton and was flying to China. So we said, listen, we want to bring manufacturing back to New Jersey. The governor has very significant clean energy goals, very strong focus on innovation. It just, the stars aligned perfectly that it was what we wanted. You might also have read that we made an investment in the hub here in New Brunswick, right around the corner, right? So we're clearing the dirt. Um, it's starting to progress. But that is going to be a life science and digital health focus. And again, it's a physical location. We're bringing the partners together. So it has Rutgers, it has Princeton, it has Middlesex County. The EDA is going to have offices there. Um, RWJ Barnabas, Hackensack Health. You can go from ideation to patient in that building with co-working space and we're populating now soon, I hope there'll be announcements around some other strategic partners that we're bringing into that space. So the physical piece of it I think helps determine um, some of that focus, right? Um, and it plays naturally. So life science plays very, very naturally to the center part of the state. We work very closely with our colleagues at Choose New Jersey to really do scatter maps on where the talent is and what the degrees are in. Um, you might have heard about the Windport that we're doing in Salem County. Um, that is a place-based economic development play. So clean energy, EDA d did the first of its kind marshalling port. Um, we're building turbines there um, and the supply chain that's going to support that. So those, um, I think, unique pins in the map are something we've never done before. You know, it's really been diluted a bit, I think. Um, and so we're really trying to coalesce the assets that we have and put a spotlight on them. Um, you will hopefully hear at least three more of these kind of strategic industry focused centers around the state. The governor gave us $100 million in the state budget to make investments. So interestingly, EDA is an investor in all of these. We are an equity partner because we have that long-term like-minded view. It's not a grant. It's not a, you know, go have it and see what you can do. It's we're, you know, rolling up our sleeves and working in tandem um, with who's ever managing um, these facilities on our behalf. I, I would, I would answer the question slightly differently because most of what Kathleen described does not suit itself for early stage entrepreneurship. So I think it's excellent for high growth innovation. Um, I, I don't know what your individual businesses are, but I, I think New Jersey um, sh should and does broadly welcome innovation in any regard. Also has a few areas of strategic fit, some she just highlighted. Others where because of this strong talent base, tons of capital though disorganized, uh, top home of Fortune 500s, there are ways, you know, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. I would go anywhere in the world where there was opportunity. We have a lot of that opportunity. We don't, we're, we're working on organizing it better. But I, I think it's a, I think there's a lot more untapped opportunity and therefore added differentiated value for entrepreneurs who know how to unlock it. Was there a question back there? You're just stretching, maybe just a stretch. Um, I, I want to come back to a couple of things because Kathleen talks about the mission and, you know, even describing, um, uh, golden seeds, people who want to give back. And there are certainly, there are lots of people in New Jersey who I think believe in the underdog mentality, have done well for themselves, and do want to help. But at its core, we are talking about people who are investing money for a return. This is not philanthropy. Yep. So I want to be very clear, the reason I, I wanted to address some of the, the fundamentals of the funds is because I find all too often entrepreneurs don't understand the audience or the motivation of the investor that they're pitching. And so the, the investor you speak to at an early stage has different motivation, potentially this giving back mentality, than someone at a later stage, like we talked, you know, Vaughn talked about investing r roughly $3 million in a round. 
there are often, you know, if you look at 10 companies in a portfolio in a venture fund, typically you have one that hopefully becomes a unicorn or what's called a fund maker, meaning returns back that roughly $100 million because several others will fail and some of the others will be singles and doubles. So for those pitching, it's extremely important that you understand the audience and the motivation of your investor to know what it is that they're after. So with that in mind, often it comes up with, you know, how much of my company am I giving away? Am I losing board control? What are the dynamics here? Kathleen highlighted before that an investor is doing this for an exit or for a company sale because they need liquidity in this. Mm -hmm. So Vaughn, can you, you, you mentioned 10%. I, I want to dig in a little deeper though. Like at what stage of a company, um, how do you think about valuation? And is 10% the going rate? That's a little low compared to what, you know, I guess it depends on the stage of the business, but can you, can you dig in a little bit deeper on what an entrepreneur should, should expect to sell in the course of raising capital? Yeah, and I will answer that question. The only other point that I would add to your comments is great founders, those who are willing to take risk, they go where the money is. And so the other way in which what Kathleen has done and others is if there are other funds like mine, like Tech Council Ventures, and or if Tech Council, Newark, and name a few others, if they have more capital, then the entrepreneur will recognize that they can raise capital and that we have relationships later on that can be helpful. So there is somewhat of a, I don't want to say chicken or egg, but the reality is also is the more capital uh, that is here in our state willing to invest in seed stage companies, the, it increases the likelihood that great founders will want to build their businesses here. And there have been great outcomes of New Jersey residents who've built massive companies. And if we were to study that, we probably should at some point of how much New Jersey capital was in them. It's probably a small, very small percentage of the capital that was invested. We changed that dynamic by having other firms get bigger. So that's just wanted to add that. Um, so what, what should your expectation be? Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question because the market essentially in certain sectors to a degree predetermines what the valuation is. If you have some revenue, oftentimes, I don't want to get too far in the weeds of talking, using industry jargon, pre-money, post-money, et cetera. But let's just assume that I see a company that has a million dollars of AR, and by the way, it's a minimum of 10% that we're looking to own of a business. So if we're investing $3 million, that means that company is valued at 30 million. And the reason that 10% is interesting for us is because if it becomes a billion dollar outcome, as Aaron suggested, it returns our $100 million fund. So that is complementary to why 10% at a minimum is important for us or how we underwrite deals. But let's just assume your company has a million dollars of revenue. And ARR, uh, just to clarify, annual yeah, you know, recurring so, revenue. Uh, yes, I, I typically work with companies that are software, so it's annual recurring revenue. But for this topic here, let's just stay with the million dollars of revenue. And whether you're selling soap or whether you're selling software, a million bucks of revenue. And the market says, well, you know, with a, with a million dollars of revenue, this company is worth 10 times your revenue. So there is 10 million bucks, right? And why is it valued that way? Because there are probably other companies that guys like me have kind of set the market for to suggest a million dollars of revenue, 10 times forward-looking projections, it's worth $10 million. So then the question to the entrepreneur as he or she begins to raise capital is if you know you have a company that's worth $10 million and you now want it to get it to be $100 million, how much capital, how much money do you need to grow your business? And then it's like, all right, how much are you willing to give up to get there? Right? And so there's no, we, we, a lot of my peers tend to want to pretend to be brilliant and really like perfect around how valuations are created. There are some market comps that will help dictate what price I should pay for a business, but it's not algebraic. It's arguably more art than science. 
And nine months ago, 10 months ago, the entrepreneur had a lot more control over telling you how much his or her business was worth, or if it's a founding team, how much their business was worth. As we all understand, the economy has shifted a bit. Um, so therefore, the investor now has a little more leverage in saying, well, what was worth 10 million eight months ago? We like to think it's worth 8 million. And it becomes a negotiation. So I, I, I'll spare you the, the technicalities as to how this all gets done. But it's more art than science. And there are market comps that help both the entrepreneur and the investor. And what you should be looking for is a good partner in your deal. A good partner who sees a fair valuation that's good for the entrepreneur to help him or her stay motivated, meaning that they still have enough of their company to go out and create a billion dollar outcome. And the venture investor should not be a vulture. They should be looking to be a partner. You should underwrite your fund and your ownership percentage, if that's important to you, to generate enough of an outcome so that your, your general partnership is happy, your limited partners are happy, and the entrepreneur is happy, and he or she or they win, such that at the next time they start a business, you're the first phone call they make, because you were fair in determining at that point in time how their value, how, the, how their company was valued and you're looking for some fairness. So again, more art than science than technical for purpose of this discussion, and I'm happy to go into you know, other parts of the valuation process now or later. Yeah. Sorry. Any questions? Yes. Um, so I have a question. So to get product or service, right, from concept to be commercially ready so you can have revenue, right, you need, like someone like myself needs funding, right? Um, how does DC work in that space, right? Are you thinking specifically about a product or a service? Um, product. And a service company. Are you in the life science industry? Life science industry. Life science industry. So life science industry, all bets are off, right? Um, it, you, you don't see revenues for a really long time, and for the most part, you don't ever see revenues. There's an exit. that It's an asset that's sold, right? Um, health tech. Health tech. Okay. All right. Very different than drug discovery. Yeah. 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 But there's a hardware component, you're saying? Yeah. A physical component? There, there is a hardware component? Uh, I would say commercially available hardware that you can use. So you're not developing hardware, you're developing a platform. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's no, it's, like, listen, who, who are you? How big is the market? Are you build, who's your targeted customer? Are you building something that's nice to have or need to have? And then understand where the money is and start marketing yourself accordingly, right? And so there's, there's a lot of capital out there. So, so for something like the, someone would say, well, that's a pre-seed deal. It's concept risk, it's pre-revenue, it's pre-product. Kathleen mentioned something earlier about how that's just longer on the time horizon. There are some institutional pre-seed funds out there who are willing to take what I would call concept risk. We're not one of them. There are some folks out there who do that. And then there are just high net worth individuals which gets dropped into that bucket of friends and family who are willing to take pre-revenue, concept risk, first time founder or no? Are you a first time founder or no? I would say uh, yes. Okay, so you, you, know, you fit the criteria of high risk but really high reward if you're able to pull it off. Right? And so don't be discouraged by that, but just understand the landscape of like, who is likely to take this bet on me? And there's, there are networks of folks who can help you get there, but it's, and what is the minimal amount of money you need to help you get to, you know, if you phased out your company to phase one or phase two of the development on your roadmap is how I would be thinking about it. Well, I also think there's a couple other avenues, right? So federal government um, is a great resource, be it SBIR, depending what industry, NIH, right? If you can get federal money to validate your business, that's huge. Did that take time? Yes. 
it, I was going to say, does, if, if you have many months. It does, but not as much as you think, right? Months. Six to nine months. months. Yes, Entrepreneur months. Entrepreneur time is your enemy. So I would say that's a nice thing to do, but not the first stop. Yeah. Well, it, it, again, it depends how much technology. So software, maybe no. Hard tech, um, maybe yes. The other advantage we have in the state of New Jersey is we have a group called the Commission on Science, Innovation, and Technology. Just came back online during the Murphy administration. They're a granting agency that takes risks. So they have something called the Catalyst Grant. They'll go up to $250,000, pure grant money for you to demonstrate your project. Um, so that's a really great resource for you. The other piece I briefly mentioned as well is, again, it's not for the startup, but once you've been in business a couple years, you can monetize your New Jersey losses. You can sell them to a profitable New Jersey company. We have a $75 million pool that we give out annually at the EDA for companies that have to have IP. You have to have a certain number of employees, um, but you use the money any way you see fit. It's worked huge for the life science for the pharmaceutical industry. Average award this year was $3 million. Non-dilutive capital, use it, go grow your business. Um, so you, you almost have to be creative. Um, the other thing is contracts, right? So once you have a demonstration project, if you can find a potential customer that will beta your project, it's a great validator. You know, in all of the VC funds that I invest in, they all require revenues. None of them are taking that demonstration risk. There are not a lot, quite honestly, on the East Coast, some in New York. It's more a California mindset. So I worked for Silicon Valley Bank for a number of years. California happens all the time. New Jersey investors are a little bit more conservative and, and don't often take that pre-revenue risk. I think that, um so I want to also highlight incubators and accelerators. So there are a variety of, of companies that will put you through a program, depending on the program, give you anywhere from ten to $250,000 for anywhere from 1% to 20% of your business, mentor you and help you get you to the stage where you're ready to. Typically the end game is a, a, what's called a demo day or a pitch day to get you in front of investors who hopefully help you get to that next, that next round of funding. Um, I would clarify, New York has gotten much more aggressive on early stage conceptual deals. New Jersey, we're just an immature market um, and there's, there's a little ways to go I think on, on investors, certainly <coughs> institutional investors. I think it's risk, right? It's a, it's risk, a risk profile. profile. That's right. yeah, it's not, I don't think it has to do with immature market, it's just the nature of the risk profile. Well, the, are you saying image, well, I'm saying immature in that the returns haven't been there to justify added risk. So New York's had enough capital recycle in the market that they've got enough money to say we're on fund 6, 7, 10, 12. Right. We can, you know, our billion dollar fund can take 50 million and just, it's play money. Here the 50 million is the fund. So I think it changes things. There's not a, we're, we're working on something. If we well, get, what was uh, the question? Is there a Y Combinator in New Jersey? Uh, look, there are some great accelerators and the EDA I, I, has helped to attract more and I believe is actively working on this and has some programs for it. We have partners with six accelerators. Not all are in New Jersey. Um, so I'll give an example and we talked a little bit about diversity. Morgan Stanley runs a, a multicultural innovation labs. Um, if you are lucky enough to get accepted into their program, it's extremely, extremely selective. Um, we will match the 250000 of capital that they give you. So uh, on the EDA website, there's a program called NG Accelerate, and it lists all of our partners. Clean Tech Open Northeast is one of them. And, you, and, and the goal for us is really go where you have to go to get the best in class. We are working on building best in class here, but until then, go. But we want to make sure you come back. <laughs> So we will match your funds that you get from them upon graduation to anchor you here in New Jersey. Um, so again, they're listed on our website. Um, there are a few in life sciences, as I mentioned, clean energy, multicultural innovation labs at Morgan Stanley, uh, and the list is growing. I think we're in diligence on another four right now. Vaughn touched on something in his comment as well about um, if you're a first time founder, you're really pitching yourself. And I, I talked before about the audience that you're, that you're pitching. The average VC you know, sees two to 3,000 deals a year. Is that in line with what you tend oh, to right. see? So from their perspective, 
when you meet them that day, they're probably seeing a dozen other deals. And even if they like, in this case, let's say you, you've got to convince them not just is this an interesting idea, but it's an interesting idea, a great founder, and I have to invest right now or I'm going to miss the boat. They're literally thinking, like if you imagine a train station with a, with a dozen trains, each startup is one, they're trying to figure out which one's about to leave the station. Because leaving the station means the valuation is going up, right? And they don't want to miss that chance to, to get their, let's say it's 10% at 3 million if it's going to cost them 5 million in six months. And so understanding your audience, un proving to them that you have what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur, and likely if you're an early stage first time founder, saying to them, there's an excellent chance the outcome of that meeting will be, this sounds interesting, keep us posted. And if you say to them, in three months I'm going to achieve X. And you come back three months later and you say, not only did I achieve X, I learned this and here's what we're doing next. You continue to show your results driven. All the best founders that I know do exactly that. And eventually the you know, investors are in or out. But I would, I would very much encourage you to focus on telling people what you're going to do, going and doing it, keeping in touch. And then, I mean, the goal, to, the best advice in, in this game is the goal is to get the next meeting, not to get the check. The check will come eventually when they realize you're, you're going to move on to other meetings. And to that end, twice a year, uh, there's an event called New Jersey Founders and Funders. Um, any New Jersey business can sign up for it on the EDA website. I think the next one is slotted for January. Each, invest, each entrepreneur who comes to that is guaranteed eight to ten one-on-one -on -one meetings with investors. Sold out event every single time. There's no fee. We actually say we even pay you, give you lunch. Um, but the goal is to give you that opportunity and that platform to meet with investors. Uh, NVP is always there. Tech Council Ventures is always there. We bring out-of-state investors in. 10% of the companies have successfully raised money. Um, but some have walked away and said, I didn't even know I had this competitor. Like, I'm, I'm out. You know, and, and that's okay, right? Like de-risking is sometimes saying this isn't a good business model. And so you get invaluable free feedback and you get those connections if you come to that event. So some of the VCs that we work with as LPs, they're like, it's a great pipeline for us. And you know, they get follow-ups as Aaron was talking uh, about from, from those events. So if you're interested in meeting, again, twice a year we run it. Any other questions? We're going to wrap up shortly. Anything else in the audience? Vaughn, what? Yes. So, uh, a comment right off of what Vaughn stated, a lot of risk that is taken at an early age is circumstance, right? It's what? Circumstance. Yep. How well is this good founder? I've heard that a lot of early stage VC funds don't actually fund early stage companies. They just maybe once or twice, but the rest are a little, a little bit later stage to kind of mitigate the risk. The ethos of trying to fund someone that's is there, but how well are people actually acting upon that? Well, you know, the venture, the early stage venture business is massive, right? Every fund, every firm has a different approach. We had an accelerator in fund one, it was helpful, it was great for us. You can't, you know, in our opinion, you can't be a great accelerator especially on the, the size fund we're running, and a great investor. This takes two different skill sets, per se, for our size fund. And fund two, we remain committed to backing very early stage businesses by writing $125,000 to $200,000 checks, taking some of that concept risk, um, backing first time founders for two reasons. One, um, there is some economic benefit. Two, we want to get a toehold in the business to maybe lead the seed round, et cetera. And so the blanket statement of like people aren't really doing it, hmm, I don't think that's fair. I think the reality is how, you know, if, if you're a first time founder, is it harder? Yes. Um, but are you building something compelling? Are you a first time founder with enormous grit and tenacity. How hard did you work to build a network of folks who'll come work for you if you're in a B2B space and then what does your pipeline look like and how are you going about attracting customers? Is the market big enough for you to create a big outcome? And what, like, what are you willing to do to ensure that you won't fail? 
because the knock on the first time found is just not a knock, but you haven't done it. So the odds of you failing are greater than those who either have done it and failed already, or they've done it and had some success, or they've done it and had some great success. And so, you know, it, it's, we have in our portfolio first time founders. Part of it is because we're a relatively smaller fund. And so if you went and you built Twitter in Silicon Valley and you're gonna go and raise another, you know, you're gonna raise capital to start another business, it's very unlikely that Newark Venture Partners, short of a relationship, would get access to that deal. And so we have to take that risk but we're gonna underwrite it pretty su substantially to ensure that we can put belt and suspenders around a first time founder's chances of success. Hey, we, we take a bet on a business, I think Princeton is technically Mercer County, father-son business, graduate from Princeton. We were the first check-in and this person had no founding experience and then eight months later after that first check, Bessemer came in and wrote an even bigger check, right? And so we took that early risk because we believe in the market, we had a thesis, smart person took that bet and then he moved on. So we're, not every fund is built like ours, but there are funds out there who are willing to take that risk, but needs to see some traction, do you have customers? Who are you? What are you about? What's your value system? How bad do you want it? Those are the types of questions that will often come up in dealing with a first town founder. How does that define failure? You said that a lot of times you look at founders that fail, but that's a good thing. I mean, zero is a good starting point of failure. So you raise capital and you shut it down and it went to zero. That's not bad for the next deal, right? Like, so you knew you, ra you you took risk, you raised capital, uh, you built a product, and like you missed the shot. So it's that founder who walks into the office and is operating with trepidation around like, yeah, I'm going to try this again, and I, I think it's going to work, and you know I learned a little bit from the last time, versus the guy you don't want to be you know too arrogant, and the guy's a euphemism for you know, male or female, so forgive me. But you want the person who comes in and says, like, listen, I got product market fit wrong because I didn't take into the calculus these four things, and here's why, and here's how I proved it. In this new business, you know, here is why I think it will work, and here's why I'm better as a founder. And so the idea of a, a first-time founder versus a second-time founder, keep in mind, I didn't say, <laughs> for MVP, hey, we're looking for, you know, repeat founders who've had wins. We want disproportionately to see a repeat founder. He or she could have failed or didn't achieve a big enough outcome or just like, yeah, this was hard, but now I'm back and here's why, so. Yeah, and we're gonna wrap shortly. Yeah. Can I just, yeah. I just, j j j because th these are very blanket statements. So let's just bring it right to you. What help do you need? My, my example of Is that okay, Aaron? Yeah. yeah. There's like 20 people here. Why not? I went to Rutgers at one of the some of the locals. Me, I live in the next. I love this state. I appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, we just, we're going from 150 ARR to 400 ARR. I'm spending every single bit of money I can bringing on new sales folks. 
and I don't know where to go for, for capital. To be honest, I, I never even learned that. And so I'm in a weird spot where it's like, what do I do, guys? You know, I need an education. Mm -hmm. I went to Rutgers, it's not a knock on Rutgers, I studied the math, so I didn't study the business side. Uh, so I wish at every stage, I think early on, I could have fallen down. I, I ran out of money, and it could have been, hey, go well, away from somewhere else. But I think, you know, there's a lot of people where they're losing, and maybe they can, at that stage, someone can jump in and say, hey, let's help you out. This is what you need to do. At the stage that I'm right now, this is what you need to do. Right now, for us personally, you know, everyone, we're looking to raise money and to accelerate. So, what? So, software company? Sorry? Is it enterprise software? Yeah, we sell enterprise software. We have, like, uh, every right aid, every app. When did you start the... When did you start talking, the business? We're talking hundreds of thousands of ARR or millions? Because those are big differences. Of That's what I thought. We're at hundreds of thousands. It was just me until three months ago. Uh, I started the business in 2017. You know, okay. So I'm spending all my money, though, and I'm just so new that I'm like, okay, wow, it's organic coming in. And I made a mistake. I should have had more money for you. I think that, you know, one is going to events like this to build a network to see who you can meet and get in front of is a huge part of the process. I mean, Kathleen talked about a few events like Founders and Funders for You could make a lot of sense. You'll grow your network and there will be likely some investors where the profile may fit. Vaughn, did you have something you wanted to add? I was no. going to add a yeah. couple other things. Yeah. So um, you should uh, certainly talk to Tech Council Ventures, which is the venture fund associated with uh, Tech United. Get on their radar and start talking early to them. Um, we're happy to share their contact information. You can go on their website. Jumpstart New Jersey is an angel networking group that invests with companies at your size. Again, associated with Tech United, EDA is the seed capital for that group. You can go on their website. So Jumpstart New Jersey, uh, Tech Council Ventures, those are two funding sources for you. The Commission on Science, Innovation, and Technology you should go on their website. They will have funding grants. You would be a strong candidate for that because you have revenues. And then the EDA colleague who covers tech, I saw him in the back of the room, He's, he left. Um, but the woman sitting in front of you two rows, Sandy, if you give her your card, she'll make sure that the tech uh, industry focused person at the EDA gets in touch with you. So three things for you. I am told we are out of time, but I appreciate both of you joining us and everyone here sitting in. Thank you very much. Next panel is at 2.10, so will you stick around. Great, thanks Aaron.